Hi, good evening, uh, everyone. It's seven o'clock. Uh, welcome along. If I can just get a quick sound check. Thank you, Paul. You read my mind. Good evening um, to everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's uh, our uh, it's the time of our weekly webinar again. Um, so welcome. Lots of new faces tonight. I'm seeing uh, having a look through the uh, the list and and quite a few names I've not seen before. So welcome along and uh, thanks for um, giving up your evening and and. Uh, Hopefully you're uh, you're looking forward to uh, what we've got in store for you this evening. So, those of you that are new along, um, as I say, welcome. Thanks for thanks for coming. This is um, the last in a little mini series on on pathophysiology that we've been running um, as part of our uh, um, CPD series that we've been doing for particularly aimed at those of you going through the FREC pathway, of course. But it's uh, we we know that um, other people are finding this useful as well. We've had. Uh, paramedics, nurses, PAs, uh, all sorts coming along and and finding some of the content useful. So that's that's good to hear. So um, this little mini series was on pathophysiology. We've covered quite a uh, quite a bit over the last um, few episodes, um, and trauma is going to be the last one of the pathophysiology series. But of course, not the end of the of the um, interactive CPD series by any means. We we go on to a new subject uh, next week, which will be maternity care, which I'm I'm totally excited about teaching. So. Um, those of you uh, that, that don't know me, my name's Ines. I'm a paramedic um, by trade. I used to work for a couple of the ambulance services down here in the southeast of England, and um, I still do in a bank uh, capacity, but I now work full time in a GP surgery and primary care. Um, on the side, in my supposed spare time, I uh, run FTC training solutions and, and can be found uh, teaching the FRET courses most weekends up in Aylesbury. So. Um, so I've got somebody saying they can't hear anything. It, it does appear that it's only you that can't hear anything. So um, I've got a couple of people saying that uh, they can. So okie cokes. So welcome along, um, those of you. So obviously some issues going on at your end. Fab, let's close that off. Um, okie cokey. So uh, just we'll give it a couple of minutes just for anyone else just to arrive. We always get a few uh, little influx just after seven. So as I say, we we are a um, a pre-hospital care training provider, as they based in in the southeast of England. Our main training base is in Aylesbury. Um, bulk of our work is is delivering FREC courses. We do have some coming up uh, in the near future. So if any of you are interested in joining us, um, we do have some um, special offer pricing on at the moment. So. Uh, do take advantage of that. So um, our next FREC threes, uh, we've had a we've had a lot of interest in our FREC threes actually, um, and I think just as I came on air there, we we sold our last seat on the eleventh uh, of October FREC three, I think. So, um, but we do have um, uh, we do have a weekend FREC three course starting on the twenty fifth of September, and we do have Monday to Friday um, FREC three courses in November and December. Um, as I, said, I think that eleventh of October one is now full. Um, FREC 4 courses, we, uh, you just missed uh, a weekend course starting, so the next weekend course doesn't start now until October, but we do have uh, on the next uh, the next Monday to Friday with seats now is, is in November, actually 22nd of November, starting Monday to Friday. We are uh, filling up really quickly actually in the run up to Christmas, so please, if you're interested, do, do get booked on. Um, we do have the pay it monthly finance options available um, if you do need that. Uh, those of you with your FRET4 already, um, we do have the, the annual ILS refresher. Uh, we run those every couple of months. Uh, next one is on the 17th of October. Um, and of course, the Safe Administration of Lifesaving Meds, which is a hugely popular course. Um, we've had a couple of cancellations, so there are some spaces on our course uh, this weekend, 11th and 12th of September, if anyone's interested in that. Um, our next one in November is looking like it's going to fill up any day. So if you're interested in some, to uh, pop along this weekend if you're free. Um, fab, where are we up to? So it's four minutes past. Um, okay, so, right, Paul, so you're struggling with sound as well. So, okie dokie. Is anyone else having issues with, with uh, my sound? Hopefully it's not our internet connection. No, okie dokie. Right, so uh, loud and clear, fine. Okay, seems to be localised issues then, so uh, I'll press on. Fabulous, just gone, uh, just gone seven, so uh, seems like most of you are here. So uh, let's get going then. So the series so far, those of you that are new to it, we've covered CPD requirements and anatomy and physiology. This is the last, as I say, in this little mini series of pathophysiology, which will be concentrating on trauma this evening. Uh, next week, we're going to go on to maternity care. Uh, we'll be doing some sessions on, on patient assessment techniques uh, and, and, and then specific uh, paediatric assessment techniques. 
be looking at sepsis, uh, we'll be looking at oxygen and entonox guidelines. We'll be looking at some ECG basics for um, uh, those of you going through FRAC, as I say, uh, we, we did do a, an ECG series beginning of last year, which uh, we are due to update fairly soon, but this will be our, for, for those of you that are completely brand new to it. Uh, and then we'll be talking about uh, intermediate life support um, as, a, as a theory session, of course, that doesn't replace the need for you to do a face-to-face -face annual update course. Um, the purpose of this, this program really was to, to help um, predominantly those of you working through um, uh, FRAC 3 to FRAC 4. There is a, a pre-reading that you need to do, um, 20 hours minimum. Um, and, and a lot of the subjects that we talk about through this series are, are um, expected, you're expected to read around those subjects. So that's kind of the, the foundation for the subjects we've picked. Of course, as you work through FREC 4, um, there's, there's certain uh, material that you're going to need to study. And, and those of you going on to FREC 5 and AAP programs, um, this is all kind of aimed at you guys as well, particularly with the, with the latest subjects of maternity care and uh, different types of assessments. So tonight, we're going to look at some just basics around minor injuries. We're looking at head injuries, spinal injuries, pelvic injuries, large fractures, by which we're, we're really going to talk about the, the mid-shaft femur. And of course, we're going to talk about um, uh, catastrophic bleed or, or, or significant bleeding management techniques. So we'd like it to be interactive. So um, I do have the chat open. Do send me a message if there's anything uh, you want me to address or any questions you have. Uh, if I do then go on and subsequently answer it, it doesn't matter. Just throw it in the chat and, and as we come to the natural pauses, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, of course, after the webinar, you can drop us an email um, or, uh, or a text with, um, with questions that, that you may have. Um, we are going to be using Mentimeter again this evening. Got a few questions for you to answer. So do grab your smartphones and go to menti.com. Get ready to put the code in. I'll give you the code as we get there. Um, and uh, as I say, it's really good if, if you do interact and, and start answering those questions. But as we go through, as I say, chuck things in the chat as well if you wish and uh, call, email, tweets, etc. after the webinar if there is anything you want to talk about later. In terms of uh, recommended reading, again, uh, this is predominantly aimed at those of you in the FREC pathway. So ambulance care essentials, ambulance care practice, you've probably got from doing your courses anyway. Um, Pathophysiology by uh, Lachel Story is a very good book for um, kind of what, what goes wrong with the body. Um, and I've got PHTLS, the Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Support, the UK edition um, there for, um, for tonight's session, I think is, is particularly apt. If trauma is something that interests you, I do recommend that book. It's very, very good. Um, it is on sale through our website, and if you do any courses with us, you get a 10% discount um, if you buy it on the course. So we're just going to go through some, um, uh, some terminology this evening. I've not got any particularly graphic photos this evening. So um, contusion, the word contusion is obviously just a posh word for bruise, isn't it? So having a look at some minor injuries, those of you that do your FREC 3 and FREC 4, it's highly likely you'll end up working some events at some point. Um, and it's it's very much that you know, you're know you there just to deal with with minor injuries and, and ailments, hopefully. That's, that's a good day if this is all we deal with. So contusion is really, really quite common, just bruising. It's just uh, blood leaking out underneath the skin where the small uh, blood vessels are being damaged by, by blunt trauma usually. Um, it, it's self-limiting, it's not a problem, it's painful at times, particularly over joints, um, and obviously for children can find them quite distressing at times, can't they? So in terms of treatment, there really isn't anything, it will settle down by itself, but some people find ice packs uh, are useful, and, and of course, um, simple over-the-counter um, pain relief, such as paracetamol and ibuprofen, um, where appropriate, is, is, uh, can be advised or administered, depending on your, your skill level. So, that's, that's that really abrasion, just the, the technical term of abrasion is, is graze, isn't it? So or, or graze is, the, te is, is, the, uh, is the, 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 the more common name. So um, the, the, the main issue with uh, abrasion type injuries, particularly when we talk about kind of gravel rash, if you've heard that term before, we, which we associate with, with cyclists and motorbikers that aren't wearing kind of appropriate protective equipment, um, is, is uh, particularly over a large scale, there's a, there's a high risk of infection. With the abrasion injuries, you're, you're scraping away the outer layers of the skin um, and you're exposing the kind of um, the, 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 the more sensitive layers to, to the, the outside world. And of course, whatever you've grazed yourself on is, is highly unlikely to be clean. If it's the road or, or, or muddy, um, of course, there's, there's plenty of bacteria and, and, uh, and other bits and pieces that can get in there and infect the wound. So with, with abrasion injuries, our most, um, our, our most concerning matter really is, is just trying to prevent infection as best as possible. Again, you know, as, as a, as a uh, FREC 3, FREC 4 at an event, looking after, after kids and, and adults as well that have come with abrasion injuries, cleaning the wound as best we can and, and, and keeping it covered, keeping it dressed. 
obviously large abrasions where, where people have come off bikes and motorcycles, etc. We do have to be considerate of, of there's a real risk of infection there, and and, and often A and E is, is the most appropriate place for them to go. But but small abrasion injuries can normally be managed safely at home. There's plenty of uh, products that can be poured over the counter, such as Savlon and Germaline and things like that, which can help. Um, but most of the time, it's just keeping it clean, placing a clean dressing on it. Normally, you know, when, when you do things like tough mudder and, and all these kind of challenges where, where people are coming to you with loads and loads of these kind of abrasion injuries, sometimes the best advice you can give them is just to jump in a hot bath when they get home um, and, and just keep an eye out for anything becoming infected. So, but from our point of view, clean it, dress it and uh, appropriate safety netting advice. So uh, lacerations, um, this is a, a medial malleolus, so just at the inside of the ankle. Um, so you can see uh, laceration is basically just where, where the skin has been cut. You may also hear the, the, the term incision. The difference between incision and laceration is incision is nice and clean and normally indicates it's been cut by a, by a sharp object, whereas laceration is more of a tear, uh, so kind of a blunter. Um, a blunter object that's that's caused it. Either way, they often do require closure. Um, so unless you're unless you're trained in in wound closure, that's something best left for the experts because obviously um, a lot of these uh, wounds will be um, will be uh, quite dirty. So we do need to clean them out properly, and you don't want to be closing up a wound with with dirt inside it because all that happens is infection builds. It uh, you know pus builds up, it swells, it expands, the the, the wound bursts open, and then you know. You've got to start again. So um, if, if, if in doubt, if you think a wound that might need closing, again, clean it, dress it as best you can, pop it off to um, uh, you know, minor injuries unit or somewhere suitable where, where that can be where that can be addressed, obviously the bigger laceration. There are some um, some areas around the body where where we're particularly careful with lacerations. Um, and of course, you know, the main ones we think about are, are the face and genitals, but of course. Thinking about the hands and the feet as well, particularly lacerations over over particularly um, well used joints. You know they're they're going to take a little while to settle down, and they often do require the more complex types of closure um, than than say uh, you know a laceration on on the forearm or something, for example, which which is normally going to settle down fairly quickly. So face, genitals, and 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 busy joints um, generally are are the more complex areas. You'll often find that a lot of the minor injuries units and a lot of the kind of nurse practitioner, paramedic practitioner led units aren't going to tackle anything in the face. Uh, or the genitals for that matter, but we're, we're not, when uh, you know, certainly not going to try and close anything in, in what we call the triangle of the face. So anything kind of eyebrows down to down to the chin. And that really is just the the um, the kind of scarring um, aspect of that. And, and quite often these these nasty lacerations on the face need a plastic opinion anyway. So we um, so just bear that in mind, um, these complex lacerations tend to need um, a and E rather than the, the the minor injuries unit. So let's um, let's give Mentimeter a go for the first time this evening. Let's see if it's working. Let me just um, share that with you. So head to menti.com. Um, put in the code at the top of your screen. So it's two three five three four double zero four. And answer the question for me. How are we going to manage strains and sprains? Menti.com two three five three four double zero four. Answer the question. You get three answers. Um, don't have to use them all. How do we manage strains and sprains? Hey, very good. It's almost like they made a mnemonic for this, isn't it? Rest, ice, elevate. Cold compress, good. Let's see. Aggressive function test, very good. Okay. So any advance, I mean, we have kind of covered, well, we've covered the, the, the basic principles. You, you may have heard this um, mnemonic of rice. Somebody obviously has, a couple of you have, um, and, and those of you that are getting the individual um, areas of those, that's fantastic. So we have um, rest, we have um, ice, we have cold compress. Sorry, I'm out of it. <laughs> so very good. So we've got rest, ice, uh, compress, and, and elevate. Uh, very good. Conforming bandage, yeah, very useful. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. A and E of a suspected break. We'll we'll talk about that. So um, uh, X ray facilities don't don't always need A and E for for, for smaller fractures. But uh, yeah, very good. Everyone's uh, everyone's kind of getting the the right idea there. So what I'll do is go back to our uh, our thing here. So what I just want to do, just for those of you that are interested, strains and sprains. What's the difference? So strain is where a ligament, uh, sorry, is where a tendon is uh, is affected. I always just think of strain ST. It's uh, it's got a T in it, and so has tendon. So um, <laughs> just ignore the fact that ligament also has a T in it, but tendon starts with T. Um, uh, sprain is uh, where a ligament is is affected. Now they're very similar kind of um, things, really. So so if you remember back to the um, anatomy and physiology sessions, tendons um, allow muscles to move bone, so they connect muscle to bone, whereas ligaments hold bones together. They hold joint. They give joints their stability, so they are bone to bone. Um, if you if you kind of pull one, if you twist one, if you do something that it's not supposed to do, um, to a to a tendon that would be classed as a strain, to a ligament that would be a sprain. Often you don't know, you know, there's 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 tendons and ligaments all around all the joints, and and often it's not that easy to try and figure out um, whether it is a strain or a sprain. But uh, that's just a, a nice to know. As I say, usually caused by overextension, flexion, so that's just bending of the joints uh, it, too far, um, or overuse of a joint. Sometimes you can get um, kind of inflammation of the of the, the ligaments and tendons from from overuse um, as well. So just bear that in mind. Um, in you know many many months, anyone that's done their um, their Achilles tendon is 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 very well aware of how long it can take to to, to heal, and and in some cases doesn't ever fully kind of regain. Uh, regain full use. So rice, the mnemonic we talked about there, rest, ice, compress and elevate. So rest basically is reducing uh, reducing the use of the, the joint in question, but not immobilizing. Okay, rest rest and immobilize are two different things. So resting a joint just basically means taking, taking some of the strain off, but we don't generally want to immobilize um, these joints because they tend to then seize up and actually can take longer to heal. So gentle movement, gentle exercises normally in order but uh, not not uh, anything too high contact um ice so cold compress so ice ice and, and compression so a couple of people mentioned um mentioned that in the in the uh, in the question there so um cohesive bandage somebody mentioned which is which is really good obviously that is vet wrap isn't it in, in a lot of the world so that type of stuff that physios um swear by that they wrap up joints with and, and that just kind of helps to to aid stability and and, and particularly good in sprains where ligaments are, are causing uh, causing problems. Knees and, and ankles are quite common for those um, those types of injuries. So an elevation elevation is is suspected to to help with with kind of inflammation and things like that. It's not always practical to to elevate, and and that is probably the least important of the rice, if you like. But um, re reducing movement, putting some some cold on it generally helps with inflammation. Uh, applying some compression helps with stability of the joint and elevation again can help with the inflammation side of things. Now, uh, many of you will, will know, I'm sure if you've done any reading around this, there is a bit of controversy, isn't there, in, in terms of should we be slowing down our body's natural inflammatory response, i.e. if we have done some damage to a joint, should we really be slowing down what is a normal healing process, i.e. it gets warm, it gets, it gets painful, it gets swollen, that, that standard kind of inflammatory response is how the body repairs the the you know the torn ligament or the torn tendon etc um, by applying ice by by elevating it by using anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen we're actually slowing that process down so there is a bit of controversy over rice but of course um patients want us to do something to make it feel better generally and and actually they're not too fussed about the whole evidence around how long their their injuries that's going to take to 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 fix you know whichever way we go so they just want something in the short term generally to, to help with that um and somebody did mention very cleverly so if in doubt we, you know we don't have x-ray vision strain sprains and fractures um you know have have the same signs and symptoms quite often don't they and the only way we can tell the difference is by x-ray and actually you know some some really subtle fractures get missed on x-ray too so um, if, if in any doubt, if you think somebody might have a fracture, let's let's do that. Let's treat it as a fracture. Treatment is is, is effectively the same, isn't it? We'll talk about it shortly. Um, facilitating an x-ray, somebody mentioned A&E. Um, for, for small fractures, uh, don't necessarily need A&E. Um, there, are, there are many kind of minor injury units across the country that have x-ray facility and, and radiographers and, and uh, clinicians that can manage those patients. And, and, and do their outpatient referrals to fracture clinic if, if they're needed. So you don't always need to send these patients to any. 
you know, it's it's those of you in the UK, I'm sure it's no, it's it's not news to you that A and E's are, are bursting at the seams. And if we can do our part to send people alternative pathways, then then of course we should we should take those opportunities. There you go. So um, ice packs, um, they're they're quite commonly carried, aren't they, in in, in event kits? So the cool pack is is the one most people have seen. Um, they're they're useful to have in bags. They do tend to be a bit heavy though, so you don't want too many of those. Um, but of course, the, the the real benefit of these instant ice packs is that um, on a hot summer's day, you can have a few chucked in your bag. It's not like ice cubes in a bag that are going to melt within within a few minutes. The downside is they're they landfill, aren't they? They're not they're not exactly the the greenest things in the world. But um, unfortunately, we're a long way off being green in in UK medicine, aren't we? Um, I put ibuprofen there. Anti-inflammatories are, are generally, if, if the patient does want pain relief, we tend to give um, anti-inflammatories such as ibuprofen, of course um you know if you're not qualified to administer it then you can recommend it if you are qualified to administer it then do check your contraindications before doing so there are a surprising number of contraindications aren't there with with ibuprofen if you if you read through it so let's go back to mentimeter uh let me uh find it so we're going over to the uh the next question now which is on the same code menti.com Two three five three four double eight four, and which joints can dislocate? Nice easy one. Now you've got three answers. I'm sure there are, you can all think of at least three. Which joints can we dislocate? Shoulders, knees, all of them. Yeah, good. I'll go with that. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. I think the common ones absolutely so shoulders coming up isn't it knee patella the patella of the knee is, is is really quite common fingers definitely rugby players they seem to do that uh shoulders yeah shoulders um knees elbows elbows particularly in kids um yeah elbows can pop out quite easily um lovely hips yeah hips are really really painful when they do go um good perfect Thank you, Koki. Well done. Yeah, we're on the we're on the right lines. Fantastic. So, whoops, why is this not working? There we go. Okie dokie. Fine. Whoops. What's going on here? Right there we go. So dislocation. Dislocation is it, it, you're absolutely right. Somebody said all of them. Or a couple of people said all of them. They um, any any joint in theory can dislocate. Okay, but it does tend to be um, uh, a set few. Obviously, the ball and socket joints tend to tend to be quite prone to this. So we tend to think of the shoulder and, and the hip. We we look at fingers as well. Fingers can can quite happily um, dislocate. You know if if, if pulled. Um, a patellas, patellas of the kneecap um, is is a really common one. They tend to slide inwards or outwards, um, and uh, and of course ankles as well. Ankles can um, can fracture uh, and dislocate. Uh, generally, generally they dislocate when uh, when there's been a fracture. Uh, I put a picture of a shoulder dislocation up there. The the um, the obvious sign with a shoulder dislocation is having that kind of real square edge. You see kind of a, a very marked um, irregularity. It's a shame we don't have a photo of. This, this patient straight on, so you can see the normal shoulder versus the uh, the one that is out. So, perfect. So we'll flick back to um, the uh, Mentimeter again, just for the next question. This someone's just saying that the link on Facebook was wrong, so we'll get that checked. Thank you for, for bringing that up. So let's have a look at the next question here tonight. So uh, back to menti.com. So 2353 Um, How do we manage dislocations then? So we've talked a little bit about how we're going to manage strains and sprains. How are dislocations generally going to be managed? Bear in mind, we're looking at um, we're looking at FRET 3, FRET 4, FRET 5, um, kind of initial management. I don't know if we've got any trauma and orthopedics surgeons in tonight, but... Uh, Excellent. Carefully, with tender loving care. I like that. I like that. All patients should be should be TLC'd. <laughs> okay. Um, so absolutely, yeah. So from from a threat free to threat five point of view, uh, not relocation. We're 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 not trained in in doing that. Um, that's that's again outside of hospital relocation of 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 um, dislocations is is quite. Uh, um, 
So it's quite a controversial subject. Okay, if you look at NICE guidance and, and a lot of the, the uh, Royal College of Surgeons guidance that um, everyone really should be x-rayed before reduction and x-rayed post-reduction, unless there's a, a kind of a limb threatening um, reason why not. And, and certainly the, the guys that do um, reduction outside of hospital and the ambulance service, you, we would have to have a kind of clear indication as to why we were trying to relocate without x-ray so just um bear, bear that one in mind but absolutely immobilization coming up in the middle splinting immobilizing where comfortable absolutely that's the key entinox great entinox is a great pain relief yes it's a very very painful thing to do so definitely analgesia pain relief in whatever form you have available and whatever form you're allowed to give um good but yeah gentle support making them comfortable immobilizing where it's comfortable um but yes unless unless you are specifically trained to do pre-hospital reduction then then no definitely not um uh putting it back in so there we go dislocation sends so the joints commonly affected shoulder knees fingers ankles hips and uh elbows particularly in children you've got that pulled elbow you know when you children have a little bit of a tantrum and you kind of grab them by the arm and lift them up and and you yank their uh, yank their elbow out that's that's not an uncommon injury um to, to see or you know not not through child playing up sometimes just they want to be picked up don't they you pick them up by their arms and out it comes so um how do we manage dislocation immobilization of the joints so in whatever position it's it's comfortable in whatever position it, it ends up in pain relief in in whatever form you can give and again facilitating x-ray and reduction so generally speaking reduction of of, um, of of dislocations doesn't normally get done at minor injuries units there are a few exceptions I know of, but generally speaking a and e and that is simply because if it doesn't work um the level of sedation and, and pain relief required is 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 going to require a and e resuscitation generally that, that patient is going to require a huge amount of, of monitoring um if things don't work so and of course you need to be able to get to a trauma and orthopedic surgeon if, if it really doesn't work don't you? so um generally speaking dislocations go to a and e again follow your local pathways you know those of you that are going out to work in ambulance services um then they will tell you what to do with with dislocations and, and which hospitals will and won't take them there are some hospitals even in london that won't take any trauma i can't take uh, any kind of dislocation to Charing cross for example or even small fractures they just don't deal with trauma so um that would probably divert to St Mary's or somewhere like that. Good, okay. Um, so let's talk about fractures and there are there are many, many different types. I'm not gonna go into huge amounts of detail here. What, what we mean by fracture is the bone is broken. The bone is broken? The, the bone is broken in, uh, should uh, put my teeth back in. So um, there are a few different kind of posh words for describing how bones break. Okay, so you've got the transverse fracture on the left there going uh, nice straightly, you know, straight across fracture. Longitudinal fractures, again, um, hairline fractures, sometimes they're called um, oblique fractures at an angle, um, and we describe them whether or not they have displacement. So oblique fractures where the bone stays in alignment would be without displacements, and where the bone kind of breaks and sits next to each other, and you know, sits out of alignment would be with displacement. So spiral fractures from twisting injuries. Um, green stick fractures are really common in children. So uh, the name green stick comes from um, green sticks from trees. You know, you try and break them, they don't. They tend to bend and splinter and stay relatively intact. So green stick fractures are, are common in, in youngsters. Uh, commutated uh, or comminuted um, fractures, they are um, from significant trauma, so significant blunt force or blast injuries and things like that. Um, trauma and orthopedics are kind of nightmare, aren't they? So how do you, how do you fix something like that? Everything else tends to tends to go together quite well once you uh, once you put it in natural alignment and, and tend to hold it there which is fundamentally the, the the basics of managing a fracture so suspected fractures we tend to put things as close as we can to natural alignment and hold them there that's that's the difference between fractures and, and dislocations dislocations we tend to immobilize where they are fractures we tend to try you know pain relief allowing and patient allowing we try to put things where they're supposed to be and that just helps us out a little bit. So um, I've got this little mnemonic um, B slip duct, which uh, I seem to remember being told years ago when, when I did my technician training back in the day. Um, and, and it's just signs and symptoms of fractures if you're ever if you're ever interested in that. So bruising, swelling, loss of movement, irregularity, and pain, deformity, unnatural movement, crepitus and tenderness. There's a little bit of duplication in, in a couple of these, of course, otherwise you couldn't have made the mnemonic. But bruising and swelling seems obvious, loss of movement because obviously it's painful. Um, irregularity, as you can see in the picture there, this is a nice radius on the fracture. You can see that um, there is a, a, a bend where there shouldn't be a bend. 
Um, that's obviously going to be very painful. Uh, deformity, irregularity, I think are the same. Unnatural movements, i.e., there's the, you know, they can, they, if, if you pick that arm up, that's going to flop in a place that it wouldn't normally. Crepitus, if you picked it up at the two ends and, and kind of bent them relative to each other, you're going to feel some, some crunching underneath. Crepitus is, is crunching. You can hear it and feel it generally. It's bone on bone and um, obviously intensely painful for the patient. So I don't, I don't for a minute advocate you you pick it up just to see whether it has got crepitus um and tenderness pain you know that that's a bit of bit of duplication there so um hopefully that's useful i mean it's it's you know something like in the picture there is it's fairly obvious that that's broken that, that can't really be any other diagnosis can it so as we've said management of fractures where where possible natural alignment so put it put it where it's supposed to be and then hold it there immobilize with a suitable splint pain relief as appropriate again up to your skill set and uh, facilitating x-ray and definitive care with the with the fractures again don't always require a and &E. there are plenty and again follow your local pathways but there are plenty of alternative care pathways for for small fractures i'm not by any means saying take your you know open femur fractures to you know I don't know, State Mandeville Urgent Treatment Centre. No, <laughs> clearly not. So you would, you would, um, it, it, it's taking it into account. Small finger fractures, you know, perhaps you know, radius ulna, absolutely fine. That can go to, um, that can go to to many minor injuries units. Actually, to be fair, some some tip fibs can be managed by non A and E departments. Again, you're in that grey area. Follow your local guidance there, because there's no one one size fits all with UK hospitals certainly. So, um, I put uh, whoops, a couple of pictures there. So roll splints there, they're the, they're the kind of easy ones and, and they come flat as well that you can throw into your kit bags. They're quite useful for uh, immobilizing um, smaller limb fractures. Um, there's vacuum splints as well, um, which are more and more commonly being used by the ambulance service. And of course, the old box splints that are, you know, everywhere. So the, the, the yellow box splints for, for the bigger limbs, so for your, for your legs. Um, and the vacuum splints are very good for those as well as for entonox there again because entonox for for trauma is is uh, really really good so of course just bear in mind the caution of um of tension your thorax and, and things like that so if you've got somebody with chest or abdominal injuries just being a little bit careful with uh, with entonox of course so so it moves us into head injuries then let's kind of go top to toe a little bit so head injuries um can be quite nasty can't they they can be nasty because um, obviously the brain lives within the head and, and the brain is pretty important to, to everything that we do. So one of the main issues with the skull is it's, is it's effectively a closed box, isn't it? The only kind of entry and exit really, other than where some of the nerves and blood vessels pass, is through the foramen magnum, which is a, which is a hole at the bottom of the base of the skull which is where the spinal cord exits. That's really the only main exit from, from the skull. It's, it's otherwise a, it's a closed circuit. There's not a lot of space between the, the brain and the, um, the, the skull. Okay, there are some protective layers, which we'll look at in a minute. And there's some cerebrospinal fluid, which provides some kind of cushioning. You know, it would be a pretty poor design if every time we banged our head, we died. So we, we, we have to have some kind of cushioning and some protective layers that allow us to do minor injuries without any side effects. So, so that's why all these protective layers are there. But of course, once you breach those, once you, once you get into kind of um, significant damage underneath the skull, we can run into problems very, very quickly. So we're going to talk about some of those to, tonight. So um, there is a question over on Mentimeter again for you all. So uh, next one is uh, menti.com 23534004. Give me some of the signs and symptoms of concussion, and then we'll talk about what that is. So 23534004, give me some signs and symptoms of concussion. The vision, nausea, vomiting, good. I agree with all of those. Headache, confusion, good, I agree. Good. Craziness, memory loss, yeah, absolutely. Not making sense, goodness. Absolutely. No, I agree. Headaches, yeah, headaches coming up as, as one of the main ones, isn't it? So, good. Perfect. Amnesia, good. That's a posh word for memory loss. 
Perfect. On the right lines, guys. Lovely. Let's uh, let's flip back then. So um, this is concussion. This is a nice little uh, picture I found. So um, concussion is is a traumatic brain injury. Let's not kind of mess around with it. It is it is a um, uh, an injury to the brain, but we consider it to be transient. So concussion um, is is a stunning, if you like. So the brain has been stunned um, by by what's happened. Now there's a few mechanisms that can um, that can cause it. So obviously direct trauma to the skull, uh, blast injuries, and then we have this acceleration deceleration injury which some of you might know is as coup contra coup c-o-u-p as in the uh, the french word so coup contra coup uh coup is when so imagine uh imagine you walk into a uh, a door frame okay you bang your head on a door frame all right your head comes to a complete standstill the brain still has uh, inertia and the brain moves forward okay the brain hits the front of the skull doesn't it on, on the inside okay then what happens is it bounces off the front of the skull and and it bounces to the back again all right so it kind of ricochets with inside all right the coup so 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 uh, any injury that's caused by you know the brain hitting the front of the, the 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 skull is called a coup and then anything caused by the brain bouncing back and hitting the back of the skull again would be a contra coup that's just nice to know but that's that acceleration deceleration injury is actually really quite a common cause of, of concussion uh, obviously direct trauma I, I think rugby players whenever anyone says concussion to me i just think about rugby I've obviously covered too many rugby matches where we've seen somebody going for a tackle or whatever and then they you know next thing they're, they're walking around like they're drunk and they haven't got a clue what's going on so it's it's quite it's, it's quite obvious when you see concussion and of course the difficulty is a lot of the signs and symptoms that you've just mentioned of concussion they they are also very very similar to signs of the signs and symptoms of significant head injury which is a question i'm going to ask you in a minute is how can you tell the difference between concussion and significant head injury it's really quite difficult so concussion by definition is, is symptoms of, of, um, of traumatic brain injury that resolve generally within 24 hours, that fully resolve. Um, whereas, you know, significant brain injury is, is something that would persist longer than that and, you know, has, has, has you know, lasting effects. But you can see there some, some of the signs and symptoms, you know, very, very common. I'm sure, you know, you, you don't go very far in life with, without being told about head injury, worsening advice to you. Certainly if any of you got kids at school and they come home with a letter from the, from the school nurse saying, you know, Johnny had a, a head injury today, look out for these warning signs if you get any of these, take them to uh, A&E. And it's the same advice for us, isn't it? If you get any, any, uh, you know, a combination of warning signs, um, then, then we, then we do have to kind of take it seriously, don't we? And, and, and I think always have a, you know, a, um, a low index of suspicion really of, of significant head injury. If you've got somebody who has a head injury and they're symptomatic, if they are, if they have got a headache, they've got blurred vision, they're feeling sick, they're not quite themselves. You know, I'm, I'm not going to sit and wait 24 hours and then say, no, nah, it's not concussion. <laughs> I'm going to take them in and, and, and get them seen. Realistically, A&E is the best place for people with head injuries if we're, if we're worried about them. They keep them under observation. Um, they can do things there that, that we can't do at the side of the road, like CT scan and, and, and all the other stuff that, that um, helps them decide whether or not it's significant. But more importantly, they can just keep an eye on them and keep doing their neurological observations and, and assess for anything worrying. So, so let's let's have a, a question then. So give me some signs and symptoms. Let's go to menti.com again. Um, give me some signs and symptoms that suggest a sinister head injury. So rather than um, rather than concussion, give me something that would or give me one or two or three things that would make you think mm, this isn't concussion. I'm worried about this patient. Eyes. I know what you mean. Oh my God, they have eyes. <laughs> they call headache. They call headache. That's a good. That's a good phrase. I like that. Yep. Blood from the ears. Okay. Good. Neurological. Neurology effects. Yeah. So neurological signs definitely. So we'll we'll come into some things. Unconscious. I'll give you that. <laughs> yeah. We'd be a little bit worried if they're unconscious, particularly if it's for a little while. Black eyes. So uh, yeah, potentially yeah. So we'll talk about we'll talk about panda eyes and, and ecchymosis shortly. Absolutely, CSF from the ears. My goodness, absolutely, you're going to be worried, aren't you? Uh, agitation, good. That's a good one. Although you can get that with with concussion. I do tend to worry about patients with agitated head injuries, definitely. Um, neurological effects. So yeah. Lucid interval, yeah. So, so don't forget, you know, the you can you can bang your head and knock yourself out for a few minutes and be absolutely fine, can't you? Um, so, so the length of that, uh, the length of that kind of um, 
the lucid, I, I, no, I think I see what you mean. So like the lucid interval, as in you, you knock yourself out and then you come around for a little while and then you start to de deteriorate. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. Uh, reduced GCS. Yeah, GCS is great, isn't it? Glasgow Coma Scale is, is designed to assess um the kind of prognosis of, of head injuries isn't it so use it absolutely i mean we use gcs for everyone don't we so you should be getting fairly confident with that if you're working in an ambulance world so um gcs for head injuries is a must it's 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 what it was there for so um absolutely good combative yeah most definitely so um again we're starting to you know see those real telltale signs that something's that something's not right so i'm going to give you some um some answers i'd come up with so compression so we we talk about concussion and compression generally with head injuries don't we so compression is basically means there is pressure being applied to the brain now that can happen for a couple of reasons um so blood blood within the um within the cranium itself um pushing down on the brain also big swelling of the brain you know from coup contra coup injuries sometimes can cause um compression injuries so compression injuries as i say that's where the brain is being compressed within the skull why does that happen i've told you the skull is effectively a sealed vessel isn't it other than the front magnum the big hole at the bottom where the spinal cord exits you've got nowhere else to absorb um any increasing pressure and we call it intracranial pressure icp you'll hear that and see that written down many times whenever you do any kind of trauma modules so um a little bit of anatomy time just to refresh again so uh, we don't need to know all the names of these things i'm sure but the the, the bone of the skull um is is obviously the outer layer and then underneath there you have three protective layers between the skull and the um the brain itself so we have the the, the three layers of the uh, meninges the dura mater the arachnoid mater and the pia mater the dura mater being a tough kind of outer fibrous layer which is split into two um then you have the arachnoid mater which has these little kind of uh, villi which which um travel down towards the brain that's what gives it the the the, the arachnoid name I, they look like little spider's legs that's that subarachnoid space that space underneath the, the the arachnoid layer is where the cerebrospinal fluid circulates um and then you have the pma so which is effectively sticky about plastic stuck to the brain um and and it's just that very kind of thin um protective layer over the, over the top of the brain itself so that the um that the, the the kind of the, the white matter and gray matter doesn't doesn't get exposed to to um anything that it shouldn't be so um we talk about compression generally being intracranial hemorrhage intracranial hemorrhage tends to cause uh, the most significant compression injuries and it's something you have to be alert to when you're dealing with anyone with a head injury now I speak from experience that actually this it's it's often the the small insignificant looking head injuries that sometimes catch people out so now particularly when alcohol is involved alcohol is very very good at artificially lowering your gcs isn't it you know i, I can proudly boast of drinking myself to to very low gcs's when when i was younger so as i'm sure you'll have um compression injuries uh, also reduce our gcs fairly rapidly now the difficulty comes when you have somebody with a uh, with a head injury that you're not too sure whether it's serious or not and they're showing signs of decreasing gcs but they've just been in the pub you know and they've they've had a they've had a skin full how do you tell which is causing the drop in gcs well of course you can't and you should always go more risk aversion in, in situations like that but when we're talking compression when we're talking reducing gcs um we are talking um generally about intracranial hemorrhage now it's split into three main types it's just for information we describe the bleeding as being um which which uh, layer of the meninges it's in relation to so we have extra dual hemorrhage you may have heard of which is bleeding outside of the dura mater subdural hematomal hemorrhage sorry is, is underneath the dura between the dura and the the arachnoid maters um and then subarachnoid hemorrhage um which i think most people have heard of is bleeding within that subarachnoid space where the csf is and of course that can um that can bleed quite significantly um you know with obviously you've got a, a fair bit of space under the arachnoid mater for, for blood to gather so we can have significant bleeds um they can all be caused by trauma uh they will have different kind of onset patterns they will have different you know um patterns on ct scans if you ever get the chance to have a look at them then do very good interesting learning um and i've put in just at the bottom there something that you should always be alert to in a head injury which is something called cushing's triad cushing's triad um helps us to identify um you know dangerously raised intracranial pressure all right dangerously uh, raised intracranial pressure to the point where the patient is likely to, to die if something's not done so christian's triad gives you bradycardia a slowing of the heart rate it gives you hypertension and it gives you altered breathing all right those of you that are interested the reasons this happens is because the brain is starting to be squeezed out through the foramen magnum okay it's called brainstem herniation 
uh, or sometimes known as coning. Okay, and you get um, you get the bradycardia and the altered breathing because the respiratory and the cardio uh, centres of the of the midbrain are being squeezed effectively. Or sorry, the brainstem, not the midbrain, of the of the brainstem are, are being squeezed against the, the bottom of the skull, and they start to malfunction. So that bradycardia and altered breathing is is a sign that the brainstem is being compressed. The the hypertension is is quite an interesting effect. So as as blood um, as blood flow um, kind of escapes into the intracranial space, that increases the pressure. Um, in order for more blood to then enter that space, the heart has to beat harder. Um, so as the, as the heart has to beat harder and, and the body obviously tries to increase the blood pressure, it has to kind of overcome the pressure for the blood to get into the, into the cranium. In the first place, if the intracranial pressure is high, more pressure is required through the carotid arteries to try and get blood in there in the first place. It's a bit of a vicious cycle because as you bleed, the pressure increases. As the pressure increases, the, the systemic blood pressure has to increase to overcome that. Um, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. Once you start to see these three things, unfortunately, the prognosis for your patient isn't very good. But often people with significant bleeds, um, you, you, you don't necessarily think, oh, I'm going to see hypertension and bradycardia. You tend to think of the other way around, don't you, in shock. So, but Cushing's triad, something to look out for. Um, so we talked about basic skull, well, we're talking about basic skull fractures. A couple of you have mentioned some of the signs and symptoms. So we suspect basic skull fracture after significant axial loading. Axial loading just basically means head and feet. So if, we, if we've landed on our head or landed on our feet, um, and then we, um, then we have to consider the base of skull bones may have fractured. They're relatively weak. They're not designed to, to support huge loads. They're, their sole job in life is to hold the brain up and the brain doesn't weigh that much. So if you land on your head, land on your feet for any significant height, and obviously C-spine injury is highly likely. If you've broken the base of skull, you could easily have broken your C-spine, which we'll talk about shortly. Good, so you've seen um, Cushing's in intensive care. Yes, it does, absolutely. Yeah, no, it, it can happen very quickly. I've, I've unfortunately seen it a few times in, in, in ambulance work, and uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of anyone having a good outcome. Uh, any of my patients, anyway, that I've seen with Cushing's um, have, have good outcomes. I mean, they've all had significant trauma, so... Um, so unfortunately, yeah, it's not a not a great sign. Um, some of the signs and symptoms: basic skull fracture that people have mentioned, torrential nosebleed, bleeding from the ears, cerebrospinal fluid, that straw-like um, fluid leaking from the ears. Um, also, ecchymosis. Somebody mentioned black eyes, so panda eyes. So, so significant bruising around both eyes uh, is called ecchymosis. That's and that's uh, suggestive of basic skull fracture as well. As is battle signs, which is bruising behind the ears. Okay, over the um, over that bony bit just behind your ear. Um, and reduce GCS clearly. So any with with any significant head injury, GCS is your is your key. If GCS is decreasing and and it's it's certainly if it's not as a result of alcohol or other intoxicants, we've got to think significant head injury. Don't forget pupils as well. Pupils, um, I haven't mentioned pupils yet. I think somebody did in the in the last uh, answers that um, a, a slow or sluggish pupil, particularly if it's you know if, if, the, if the pupils are unequal, is a sign that the optic nerve is is being is being compressed by raised intracranial pressure. Not always there, they're not always reliable, but slow sluggish pupils, particularly if one is bigger than the other, and sometimes that's called a blown pupil, um, that can that can signify that compression injuries as well. And just a quick point there, um, I was just remind, but remind people, don't use no, uh, nasopharyngeal airways in um, base of skull fractures. There is always the possibility you'll just poke through into the brain um, and make things worse. Unlikely, but they are technically contraindicated in suspected base of skull. Um, difficulty is sometimes these patients can fit and get trismus and, and actually can't get an OP and you can't get an NPN. You really do start to struggle. Another reason why these the prognosis isn't so great, I suppose. But let's get back to um, Mentimeter uh, again. So menti.com 23534884 and answer me this. A uh, nice easy question there. When would we suspect spinal injury? Give me some examples. Get up to three uh, answers each. Oh, well, so somebody has actually seen an X-ray of a patient with an MP in their brain. Good. So it does. Well, not good, but it does happen. It's obviously not a myth then. So um, I feel better for teaching it. That's, uh, that's a good one. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so, yeah, loss of feeling. Falling from heights. I absolutely agree with altered sensations. Great, 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 great. Direct trauma to the C-spine. Fantastic. Absolutely. You can, you, can in, you can get hit in the neck, can't you? Impact of the head, I like it. Pain in the neck, good. 
that's all patience, isn't it? Fall from height, high speed RTC, uh, loss of anal tone. Are you, are you testing that? Rapid deceleration. Good, good. I like that. Cell anesthesia, cell anesthesia is a, a good one. That's for kind of lower, isn't it? Um, quarter equina syndrome. Excellent, steroid trauma, fall from height seems to be the common answer. Pins and needles seems to be a common answer. Uh, numbness paralysis, absolutely, I like it. And some of the types of scenarios, RTCs, yeah, all day long, isn't it? Falling from height all day long. Any rapid, rapid deceleration. I like it. I like it. It's good. Obviously, everyone's read up on this. So I think it's, you know, it's very well known, isn't it? The kind of C-spine. Here we go. Here's the spine. Um, the, the spine itself is split into, into five groups, isn't it? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral and coccygeal. Uh, sacral and coccygeal regions are fused to form the back wall of the pelvis, aren't they? Which we're going to talk about shortly. Um, as we go down the spine, the the, uh, the vertebrae, the little bones themselves um, grow in size, they get larger um, and they get stronger obviously and harder to break. So it's, it is more difficult to fracture a lumbar spine uh, vertebrae or give yourself an unstable lumbar, lumbar fracture than it is to give yourself an unstable spinal fracture. Okay. Um, what do I mean by unstable and stable? So you can have fractures uh, within the spine that uh, with spinal vertebrae that don't impinge or have no chance of impinging on the spinal column. Uh, unstable fractures are either are or have the, the ability to impinge on the spinal cord. Impinge on the spinal cord just basically means um, bone could push into it, cut it, dent it, damage it, do something like that. Spinal cord is very precious because if we break it, it can't regenerate and, and obviously we're paralysed. The higher up we're paralysed, uh, the more likely we are to die there and then. So um, there's a little rhyme, isn't it? C3, 4, 5 keeps the body alive. The nerves that leave at C3, 4 and 5, so kind of mid um, cervical region, uh, are looking after the heart and lungs. So if, if, if they get cut, your heart and lungs stop um, getting any signals. And, and of course, the heart will go on for a little while. The lungs will stop fairly quickly. So the lungs stop, the heart stops too. So, and there's not a lot you can do. There's no resuscitation that will bring you back from that. So uh, obviously the further down we go um, becomes less of an issue, but let's be honest, by less of an issue, I mean, if you fracture at the bottom, you've still lost the use of your legs, haven't you? That's not insignificant. So um, good. So we are most worried about cervical spine for two reasons. One, as I've just said, you know, the most important bodily functions are controlled by the spinal nerves that leave um, at the cervical region. Um, and of course they are the weakest of the vertebrae. It's a bit of a design flaw, isn't it? But ultimately, if we had lumbar sized vertebrae in our neck, we wouldn't be able to turn our head around so much, wouldn't be able to dance, which actually for me would be a great thing. So I'd sign up for just have lumbar vertebrae all the way through, but there we go. Um, good, then we have the thoracic vertebrae tend to be relatively strong because of course they connect to ribs, don't they? The ribs connect to the thoracic vertebrae at the back and then at the front of the sternum. Um, so by, by definitely, you know, the thoracic region tends to be fairly strong again, quite hard to break. The lumbar region, just because it is so, you know, they are so thick, they are quite hard to break when they do, very, very painful, but they tend not to be unstable fractures. Uh, again, it all depends on the trauma that the patient's subjected, don't they? So when we're talking about C-spine injury, we're going to concentrate mainly on C-spine injury now, but um, the there is a set of rules called the Canadian C-spine rule. I've not put the full rule here because it's it's very wordy. Have a look at MD Calc or JL Calc. JL Calc is, is the UK pre-hospital uh, kind of ambulance service guidance, and they, they now use um, uh, effectively C-spine, Canadian C-spine rule. If you use MD Calc, is uh, a web-based or app-based free um, kind of program that will allow you to calculate whether or not um, patient needs imaging. Basically, if you get the answer that the patient needs imaging, we should immobilize them until such time as, as that imaging can be done. And what we mean by immobilization is either manual in-line stabilization, so holding the head in, in um, natural alignment in relation to the rest of the body, uh, or we do in, in the UK, we call it triple immobilization, which is putting somebody on a, uh, an orthopedic stretcher and um, strapping them down with head blocks and, and tape and plus or minus a neck collar. I know neck collars are, are very much debated. They do have their use. Um, they also have um, some kind of almost contraindications nowadays, don't they? We, we, we're not going to discuss neck collars in too much detail because I know that it's a contiguous issue and, and, and um, each trust is still slightly different on that one. But the things to consider with neck collars when they're good, um, so unconscious casualties that can't maintain their own natural alignment, 
neck collars are good. They do. If you if you watch somebody unconscious being dragged out of a car, um, then you know us holding their head still is not as good as as um, as them. Uh, sorry, it, it, without a collar, their head moves a lot more than than if they don't have a collar on. When they're not so good with significant head injuries, there is lots of evidence now that that um, collars, even well fitted, uh, raise intracranial pressure because they occlude um, the um, the veins, uh, the veins in the neck, and, and basically, if the arteries are still pumping as normal, the veins are occluded. You're going to increase intracranial pressure slightly. So, in the context of a head injury, you don't want to increase it any more. Um, things to be aware of, as I say, each trust is still slightly different on when you would and wouldn't use a neck collar. Um, good. So the Canadian C spine rule basically looks at um, three things. First of all, so patients aged over sixty-five, we have a high index of suspicion for C spine injuries. So we tend not to clear over sixty-five. At the side of the road. Um, Paresthesia means pins and needles or altered sensation, particularly in the lower legs. If you've got um, if you've got altered neurology, we suspect uh, we have a high index of suspicion of C-spine injury. Um, dangerous mechanism, the Canadian C-spine website or MD Cal, JL Cal will give you um, examples of what that means. But basically, if someone's landed on their head, someone's been in a high-speed RTC, a rollover RTC, yada yada yada, there's loads, then they will um, be considered dangerous mechanism. Um, once you've cleared those or looked at those three things, have a think about low risk factors, things like is the patient walking, is the pain off to one side, um, did the pain come on later, is it a delayed onset, that type of thing, it's all it's all clinical judgment stuff. Um, and then uh, the final point, if you've cleared to that point, is to observe movement 45 degrees left and right, if they can do that without pain you can in theory clear uh, a neck um, out of hospital without imaging. But again, local guidelines please follow those because i know everywhere is slightly different and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of clinical judgment to be to be had there so that's everything we wanted to cover so uh back to menti menti.com riddle me this what are the main complications of uh, pelvic fractures please why are we bothered about pelvic fractures We are going to run on slightly tonight, folks, as you probably guessed. There's still a little bit to go. Pelvic fractures, long bones, catastrophic hemorrhage, blood. Yeah, I agree. Anything else? Blood loss is a thing. Rupture of the urethra. Interesting. Yeah, true. Big bleed, organ damage, age hemorrhage, cat hem. Good. With. Yeah, unstable. Oh yeah, absolutely. When you're, um, uh, yeah. So I think we're, we're we're absolutely nailing the head here, and nailing, hitting the nail on the head. <laughs> Can't talk tonight. Um, significant blood loss is going to make your patient very very unstable. There's there's potential for significant um, kind of trauma underneath, absolutely, and, and organ damage. So fantastic. Uh, difficult packing, yeah. Um, I mean, it's difficult. I, I think what you mean is it's very difficult to stop the bleeding, isn't it? So um, if you're bleeding internally, clearly outside of hospital, there's not a huge amount we can do. Um, good. Perfect. OK, we're going to talk about pelvic fractures. So you're absolutely right. One of the big issues with pelvic fractures is the is a the, the supply to the pelvis itself is significant. Um, the textbooks will tell you you can you can lose easily five litres of blood into your abdominal cavity through a pelvic fracture. Um, I don't know where they get those stats from. I wouldn't want to be part of that trial, but I can imagine that's true. There's, there's a very good blood supply to to the pelvis, and don't forget you've also got these kind of openings through the um, through the front of the pelvis where your um, your femoral arteries travel, where big nerve blocks uh, nerve kind of bunches travel down into the legs. If you separate the pelvis, if the pelvis opens like an open book fracture that we talk about, um, you can rupture the femoral artery. Clearly, if you rupture the femoral artery, not a, not a huge amount we can we can do outside of hospital. Um, but the pelvis itself, if it is fractured, can bleed significantly. So, what do we do? Why do why are we so fussed about putting these pelvic splints on? And and actually, it's that it's to stabilise the pelvis as much as we can. I, I said the, the, the management of fractures, broadly speaking, within your scope of practice anyway, is to put things where they're supposed to be and hold them there. And, and the pelvis is no different. If we put the pelvis back, so if the pelvis is an open book fracture, that's the most common one. Think motorcyclists, um, front on collision, they stop suddenly, they go forwards, legs split open on the, on the fuel tank and they, and they get a nice clean open book 
pelvic fracture puts lots of pressure on the on the femoral arteries in in both legs the pelvis itself will bleed um, what we do is we put a pelvic splint on to close the book again that can reduce the bleeding of the pelvis itself and it takes the pressure off those femoral arteries making them less likely to rupture that's they're the two main reasons why we use the the, the pelvic splint I am told by patients I put pelvic splints on that it does actually significantly reduce their pain as well, as does the femoral traction split that we're going to talk about very shortly. Um, both of these these mechanisms can actually reduce your patient's pain score um, quite quite significantly. It makes things a lot more comfortable for them. Not you know it's not going to take it away, but just bear in mind you'll see in bold there the pelvic splint should be centered over the greater trochanters. The greater trochanters are these sticky outy bits of the femur. Um, and they are, if you're struggling to landmark them, basically if you, where, where the pockets would be if you were wearing jeans, for example, if you, if you feel around there, the first bony lump you feel um, below the waist, um, then um, that's generally the, the, the greater trochanter. Um, if you're really struggling to landmark it, if the patient's a little bit overweight and you can't feel the greater trochanter, you can always just lay the patient's wrist down. So if you lie their arms down by the side, where the wrist naturally falls when they're lying flat, is roughly the level of the greater trochanter. You won't be far off if you use the wrist. Okay, um, but yeah, the, the the first bony prominence below the waist um, that you feel on the and the on the at the side. So basically, where where the top of your pocket would be, roughly. Okay, good. So that's where the centre of the the pelvic splint would go. These these are the Prometheus pelvic splints. Uh, these are the ones that uh, the two ambulance services I work for use these, um, and they they work. They they you know they do what they need to do. You cut them to size. Um, and pop the Velcro on. The Velcro is really, really strong. Put it nice and tight, and, and that will just close the pelvis again. Um, the reason we put it over the greater trochanter and not the the, um, the kind of pelvic arches and pelvic rims is just because it would actually make the open book fracture worse if you put the pressure too high. And I do see every now and again um, pelvic splints being applied too high. Um, so take it off, put it back on uh, over the greater trochanter because if you do have an open book pelvic fracture and you put the pelvic splint on too high, you're making things worse um, for yourself. Right. Good. Next, then we're going to talk about mid shaft femur fractures and we're going to talk about tractioning of those. So, this is for the, the, the kind of major bone fracture. So, the femur is obviously the biggest long bone in the body. It has a very good blood supply as well. I'm, I'm told by the textbooks, you know, anything from two to three and a half litres of blood can be lost from just from the, the femur itself fracturing. They have a very good blood supply. Of course, the, the main issue we've got with the femur is when you get displacement of the femur, i.e. they run next to, you know, the two, the two halves of it run next to each other. They do so quite substantially because of the, 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 the power of the quadriceps, the, the, of all the muscle groups in the upper leg, they spasm and they pull, and they pull that bone um, kind of you know, shorter. That, that left, that, that, in, in this picture here, you've got a picture of a, a patient's left femur that's been fractured in real life. The muscles would spasm and this bone, this part of the bone would slide up alongside it. This part of the bone would slide down alongside it. And you'd have the bones sitting next to each other uh, and the muscle in spasm. The leg would be shorter. The leg tends to rotate outwards um, and it's intensely, intensely painful. There's obviously going to be a big swelling around the, uh, the thigh itself. Obviously, you can get open femur fractures because of the force involved in those muscles pulling everything in. Sometimes that can cause the um, the uh, one of the one of the ends of it tends to be the, the the proximal end of the of the femur will penetrate the the skin around the thigh, and you'll see an open open femur fracture. Intensely painful, and as I've said to you already, by putting traction on, we can sometimes massively reduce the the the, the pain for the patient. But apart from that, some real big benefits here. We put again the basics of of, of fractures in trauma is put them where they're supposed to be and hold them there. If we pull that back into natural alignment, a we can reduce the blood the blood loss from the femur itself um, and two we can also um, prevent any any further damage if you imagine that that leg is all kind of crumpled up and squeezed up and all out of alignment the 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 blood vessels and the nerves that are going down to the rest of the foot are probably being impacted in some way so by pulling it straight we're reducing any strain on the femoral arteries and on the the kind of femoral nerve bunches that are going down to the um to the rest of the foot and we don't want to leave our patients with um if, if at all possible with any kind of residual nerve or vascular problems as a result it's you know, unlikely you get away with a femur fracture with you completely scot free but obviously we can do as, as much as we can so we apply something called a, a femoral traction splint the main ones you'll see out there are the prometheus ones also known as the kendrick's ones uh, in the uk it's it's they're distributed by prometheus and uh, i think they are actually known as kendrick splints everywhere else in the world um the company is american 
and they uh, they basically so there's a picture here on the left. It's this device here that looks like a tent pole with with three straps that that slides onto the. I've got a video to show you um, of of how that goes on for anyone that isn't familiar or just wants a quick recap. But basically, that just a, that applies traction. So basically, it pulls the foot um, uh, against the uh, against the hip. Um, and it pulls the it pulls the femur straight and puts it back into natural alignment. As I say, um, when whenever I've used them, the pain relief is 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 fairly marked. Actually, it's it's pretty it's pretty impressive how much more comfortable the patients can be once they are in traction. Good. So the Kendrix or Prometheus splint, whichever whichever you know them as, they are only indicated for mid shaft femur fractures uh, in the UK. Anyway, I know outside the UK they use them for radius ulna. They also use them for um, uh, tip fib fractures. But in the UK, we only use them for mid shaft femur fractures. They're not indicated for neck of femur or isolated lower leg fractures. So um, tip fib fractures on their own, we don't use um, the the traction device. That being said, it has been designed to be used for. It's just a UK thing that we don't do it. So not indicated for neck of femur. They don't actually help with neck of femur fractures. So um, uh, your, your elderly patients with osteoporosis um, that, that have fallen over and you're suspecting neck of femur, um, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't apply one of those. Uh, they are contraindicated with um, ankle or foot fractures on the same side. So uh, they do require a stable ankle and foot um, to, to apply the traction to. So again, can't use them in neck of femur and you can't use them in, um, in, in ankle or foot fractures on the same side. You can put two on though, you can use them on both sides. If you are going to use them with a pelvic splint, you can do, but you need to put them on first and then put the pelvic splints on after. Otherwise you find you can't get the, um, the, the, the uh, crotch strap in, as you'll see. Got a little video, this is from Prometheus, which is the UK company that distribute them. Um, this is their training video. I'll just show you for a quick recap because it's much easier for this than uh, for me to try and explain it. So it'd be interesting to see whether it's going to work. Never tried to play a video over a Zoom call before. No, it's not working, folks. So what we'll do is um, I will upload that video or put a link to that video. Oh, hang on, let's go on. Hang on, hang on. Stand by. Uh, bear with me. That's just uh... right. Are we back on there? Okay, I think um, that just uh, confused the computer somewhat. So playing videos over a Zoom call doesn't <laughs> isn't something my computer particularly wants to do. Right. So I'm going back to Mentimeter, um, and it's gone off full screen for some reason. Oh, goodness me, I have killed the computer. Good. Can you all see that? Uh, well, the, the uh, so the next question I'm going to ask you is um, how do we manage major hemorrhage? So this is the last question of the evening for you to answer, and then we'll talk about it. How do we manage major hemorrhage? So go to menti.com two three five three four double oh four. PPE, I'll give you that, definitely. Clotting agent, great. Tourniquet, pressure. Packing, direct pressure, clotting, yeah, great. I like it, definitely PPE is a good one. Fluid or blood transfusion, absolutely, that's where we're going, isn't it? But, so the initial stages, you turn up, someone's absolutely hosing it out. Good, so direct pressure. Major hemorrhage protocol. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. I like it. Cellox has mentioned clotting gauze. Great. I like it. Perfect. Yeah, we're on the right lines, aren't we, guys? Let's come back to here then. So the major hemorrhage kind of protocol, if you like, or the major hemorrhage kits that we're going to uh, talk through. So there's these things on top left here. So OLAS dressings, they're often known as, or just generically trauma dressings. We use OLAS in the ambulance services in the UK. There are also Israeli bar dressings, um, which are very, very similar. Basically, they're, they're, they're all, they all have in common um, a very adhesive, uh, sorry, absorbent pad. So a nice, thick absorbent um, dressing itself. 
um, and uh, some way of uh, applying direct pressure to the wound. So basically, the, this is stretchy bandage that, as you wrap it around, it, it applies direct pressure to the wound. And there's a little plastic cup upturned. As you as you wrap around, it pushes that plastic cup into the wound and, and applies some direct pressure for you. So really, really good. The OLAS dressings that we carry in the NHS ambulance service is absolutely fantastic. I've got, you know, I've used them many, many times, and they they touch wood. I've always done what I've needed them to do. So OLAS dressings. Uh, we've got tourniquets. So the combat act application tourniquet, the cat tourniquet um, that you'll see. There are two main types around. These are the soft ones, um, which I personally prefer if they're made of metal. Um, a lot stronger. The cat one, I can't remember who makes them, the, 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 the plasticky ones, they tend to be not quite so good. Um, then you've got the um, the two kind of main uh, brands of clotting, so hemostatic gauze or clotting dressings, as somebody called it, um, are Cito gauze and uh, Celox. Celox, most people have heard of, came from the military. Cito gauze is, is the one that we use in, um, in London. Uh, works exactly the same way. They they all market themselves as being the best. Of course they do, but they they all work they all work very very well. So um, so the other things we, that we tend to have in our kind of hemorrhage control pack. The other thing you might see are the blast bandages, which are just massive versions of these um, for kind of eviscerated bowel contents and stumps, so, uh, kind of uh, traumatic amputations and things like that. But I've, I I can handle hearts. So I've never used one in in action. So uh, the OLAS bandage has always been the one I go to. So good. Um, so tourniquet application process. Um, the there are some different versions out there. So follow your own local um, process. But if we're considering tourniquet, it's got to be for catastrophic hemorrhage, doesn't it? Or you know, a, a life-threatening bleed that we just can't control in any other way. So it's got to be catastrophic, catastrophic or life-threatening, hasn't it? Apply at least an inch above. I know some places say two inches. Sometimes it's not possible to get two inches above the wound, but at least one inch above the bleed, and ideally over a single bone. So the the the, the guidance that I can find at the moment is that uh, from pre-hospital trauma life support is that we should be still be applying ideally over the humerus, over the single bone of the upper arm, or over the femur, so the single bone of the upper leg. Where possible, don't apply them over two bones. It's just it makes them less effective. And, and you can, in, in, in elder patients anyway, you can then fracture the bones as well. Not that that's the end of the world at the time, but of course they are, they're, they're, they're just less effective over two bones. So if you apply it over, over a single bone, much more likely to be effective. The process for application is to just to pull the strap tight, whichever one you're using, they're either Velcro or, or, um, or like a, a non-return valve thing. And then twist the bar, twist the bar until the bleeding stops, secure it and note the time of the application. That's really quite important. Make sure somewhere on the patient, on the paperwork, somewhere you've written down what time the, the, the tourniquet went on. If possible, pack the wounds then with hemostatic gauze. So you put the tourniquet on and stop the bleed. Okay, that's the most important thing to do if it's really life-threatening, okay? Then what the current guidance is, is to then go back and pack the wound as best we can with hemostatic gauze if you have it available. Apply direct pressure for three minutes, they both say that, and then bandage tightly with a trauma dressing. So something like an OLAS or an Israeli bar dressing. Now, this is where everyone seems to disagree on what you're supposed to do next. The guidance or the last teaching I had on the subject was to loosen the tourniquet um, and then very carefully check to see whether you've you've actually fixed the problem okay so life-threatening bleed we've stopped it with a tourniquet packed it with cellox put pressure on and then we've done it with a trauma dressing let the tourniquet off gently and and see what happens okay if there's no bleeding leave the tourniquet in place but not tight okay uh, obviously if bleeding starts again uh, imagine it, you know immediately retighten and secure it and and personally i don't think i would i would bother to take it off then it would go it would go to hospital wherever we're going and um and 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 they can kind of deal with it from there what i do tend to tell people and, and not in it not in a bit to scare people but just assume if you're putting a tourniquet on just assume that patient is going to have that limb amputated okay so without just all that all i want you to bear that in mind for is just because that's the gravity of the bleeding that we should be using tourniquets for again i've seen tourniquets used inappropriately i've seen tourniquets used for really quite minor injuries and uh, uh, inappropriately so we do have to just bear in mind, if you think in your head, if I put this tourniquet on, that patient's going to lose that limb. Am I okay with that? Is this bleed bad enough to warrant that? If the answer is yes, crack on. If the answer is no, I'm not really sure, then then try other means first. But of course, don't let your patient die of blood loss because you you, you don't want to put a tourniquet on either. So it's, it's, it's finding that, that happy balance. Hopefully that makes sense. And 
But thank you for thank you for coming along tonight, guys. I hope that's been okay. We've overrun by a little bit, but I don't think many people tend to mind when that happens. So um, I hope it's been useful. If you've got any other questions, um, now's the time to ask. If you don't have any questions, you just want to disappear, then um, we'll look forward to seeing you again next Monday. We're back next Monday, the 13th of September at seven o'clock again. We're going to be talking about maternity care. So we've come off the pathophysiology uh, little mini series now. That was the end. Um, quickly, before you go, if you've enjoyed it, then um, then do leave us a review. That's really helpful. It does help us find uh, new customers, new customers find us. If you all just bear with me a second, I'll just pop the link in the... Um, uh, the chat for the uh, CPD certificate. You can all get a CPD certificate. Let me just go to, um, bear with me. Should have had this tab open, shouldn't I? If you all hang fire, I'll just get you the link. Okay, uh, okay, uh, number nine. Here we are. Share the feedback form. Okay. Uh, going in the chat now, folks, is the link to the CPD certificate. You have to fill out the, the, the form and then you can get a free downloadable CPD certificate. So um, that's in the chat for you now. Um, if you missed it or if it's not working tonight, sometimes they get a bit bombarded when everybody goes to it once. So if it doesn't work tonight, then it will go up on um, Facebook and on our website like it normally does. So don't, don't panic if you don't do it tonight. It will still be available in the future. Those of you that have come late or had sound issues, things like that, this has been recorded and will go up onto YouTube um, over the next day or two. Um, and as always, we'll, we'll see you next Monday for maternity care. And I'll take questions from the audience um, if any have any. And I'll pause the recording.